Well, I think I want to start with a question that I started to ask myself about five years ago. And that was, is it possible to break free from the global industrial food system? And that question started in the back of my mind really about 10 years ago in 2011. I was living a very typical, in many ways, you know, U.S. American lifestyle. I was very focused on the American dream. Um, I had a goal of being a millionaire by the time I was 30. I was very focused on material wealth and, you know, material possessions and financial wealth. And I was not paying attention to my food, where it came from, uh, how it got to me, what the impact it had on the earth or on other species of plants and animals. I was just kind of pursuing what I saw as the American dream. And what happened is I learned by starting to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books that this American dream that I was living was actually the world's nightmare. That almost everything that I was doing was causing destruction to the earth. The food that I was eating, the car I was driving, the cheap junk I was buying, the trash that I was creating, the gas I was pumping into my car, the places that I had my money invested, um, the bank that I had my money in, even the water that I was drinking was being pumped across a desert where half of it was evaporating or, or running into the desert and you know the Colorado River was literally running dry. So even every drink of water that I was taking was causing destruction. And so I, I learned that my whole life was, was causing destruction and a big part of that was my food. That was like one of my big wake up calls early on. I learned that I was consuming the planet with every bite that I took. And so early on in 2011, when I decided, I decided I was going to change my life. I decided I was going to transform my life and try to live in a way that didn't cause so much destruction. And so one step at a time, I started to take my life back from corporate control, from societal norms and stigmas that I was living my life based on, um, from living a life with, that honestly in many ways was based on lies and ideas that had been sold to me. And a big part of that was, was taking back my, my food and, and what I was putting in my body. And so over a period of two years I started to transform my life just one positive step at a time from little things like you know ditching the disposable items and using reu reusable items instead to not going to Walmart and getting all my stuff there and instead supporting local businesses to you know going to the local food co-op and buying unpackaged unprocessed foods instead of all the processed junk food that I was buying starting to ride my bicycle more and drive the car less starting to connect with my community and live a less individualistic life um, starting to you know find ways to meet my basic needs for human connection through giving back rather than through you know partying and binge drinking and things like this and so over a period of a couple of years I really started to just transform my life one po positive step at a time and by doing that what I had done is I made a goal of just making one positive change per week and by doing that for two years I made over a hundred positive changes so imagine if tomorrow you woke up and you were doing a hundred things differently than you are today. You know, the clothes that you're wearing, many of the friends that you have, the places that you're going, the food that you're eating, the smells on your body from, you know, changing your, your products, uh, uh, many of the words that you're saying. You know, imagine if tomorrow you woke up and you were doing a hundred different things differently, you, you might not even recognize yourself. But by doing it one step at a time, I was able to take my life back and to transform my life. And so that's what I did for about five years. And during that time, I started to do activism, activism that was designed to, to 
to catch people's attention, to, to shake things up, to help get people out of their sleepy state, and activism that was designed to reach mainstream media, to be able to be you know, on the mainstream TV and news stations and magazines, and be able to bring messages of reconnecting to the earth to people who really potentially haven't even thought about it before. And so that came through projects like biking across the country on a bamboo bike, trying to have no negative impact, or living in you know, a 50 square foot tiny house off the grid in the city, or landing in Central America with no money and having to travel back on the kindness of others to show that actually most people are good, contrary to the mainstream narrative that we should live in fear of our global neighbors. And so that was about five or six years of personal change and transformation as well as activism. And then that's the background that leads to this question that I want to talk about today, which is, is it possible to step away from our global industrial food system? And that was a question, like I said, in the back of mind at the beginning, but I didn't dive into that until 2017. It was December of 2017, and I decided that I was going to, for one year, see if I could grow and forage 100% of my food. Nothing packaged or processed, nothing shipped long distances, uh, not spending any money on food, just all of my food coming from my own garden that I'm growing or that's growing freely and abundantly by nature. And just one little side note, I still use the word nature because it's an easy one to understand, but of course we are nature and everything is nature. But it's just a simple way of saying rather than the garden, what is growing freely from the earth without you know, my own domestication. And so that's what I decided to do, to set out on this, on this journey and see if it was possible. And I decided to do it for a couple of reasons. One, I personally just wanted to break free from the global industrial food system, from eating my food in a way that was consuming the planet. And I wanted to reconnect with my food and see where it comes from and what it takes to meet all of my own nutritional needs down to, you know, the calories, the fat, the protein, the herbs and spices, the medicines, the salt. I wanted to, you know, experience all of that as rawly and, you know, hands-on as I possibly could. But I also wanted to take other people on the journey with me and show people that it is possible because when I decided that I was going to do this, I was pretty sure that I was going to do it. So I uh, had a couple big problems though, or let's say problems to work through. And that is one, I had no land of my own. Most people would imagine if you're going to grow and forage all your food, you might have a you know, big plot of land or at least a little plot of land to actually grow food but I had no land whatsoever. In fact, I arrived in Orlando just, you know, basically ready to start the project and had never, well, that was my other next problem. Besides not owning any land, I was showing up in a place where I had never grown anything before and never foraged. I had fished and maybe picked up a coconut or two on visits to Florida, but I was going to a new environment where I had never grown anything. But more so than that, I had grown almost nothing ever. So when I lived in San Diego, California, that's where my transition began from 2011 to, to 2016. I had two small raised beds, uh, about four by four, so like the size of one of these tables total. And I grew a few things like tomatoes and greens and things like that. And in the house before, I had one raised bed. And then before that, it was, you know, my mom's garden when I was a little kid. And, oh, I had volunteered on some gardens and things like that. But basically, I had very little experience growing food either. So I was really kind of starting from scratch. So when I got to Orlando, 
what I did is I put out the word and I said, well, I'm looking to grow food in people's yards. I chose to live in a neighborhood called Audubon Park because there's a couple nonprofits that were really focused there. There was Orlando Permaculture and then Fleet Farming. And um, with Fleet Farming, they actually turned people's front yards into little farmlets and then they sold that food locally. So there was already a bit of a culture of front yard gardening there. And then through Orlando Permaculture, I had already met a lot of permaculturists with uh, you know, who had turned some of their yards into food forests. So it wasn't a completely foreign idea to people around there, the idea of growing a lot of food. But, you know, 90, probably 99% of the yards in Orlando were, you know, grass. So I put out the word and I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking for people that would like their front yard turned into a garden and in exchange I will share all the food with you. So you get a garden, you get to eat food, and your lawn will be gone if you're no longer interested in having a lawn. And so that was how I solved the whole not having any land. And over the period uh, of about six months, I turned six front yards into gardens, all within about a mile and a half so I could bike to all of them because most, most of my work was done on bicycle. I had a big trailer as well to be able to carry things around. And I started just turning lawns into gardens with a very simple process, which was laying down cardboard, then laying down mulch, which is just trees that had been cut down by landscaping companies and then chipped up into wood chips. And I got that for free because that's a waste product of that industry and then getting some compost and soil, some plants, some seeds, and then my other ingredients were water and sun. And that's how I started my gardens. And the first garden that I grew, it cost me about $600, and within a few months it was already producing more than $600 of the food per month. So that's how I started. And what I did um, is, well, when I started, like I said, the other problem I had is that I had very little experience. And so I started off just going to the internet and typing in questions like, how much water do you put on a kale seed? Or how much sunlight do carrots need? And I was just looking up each plant, just trying to figure it out one by one. But what I quickly started to do is I would go to the local community gardens and I would just see what everybody was growing. and I'd go to the local small farms and I would just ask, what grows so well that, you know, you have too much of it? And I would ask the local gardeners, like, you know, what foods grow really abundantly and easily here that have the few, few the, you know, the least pests and actually become a problem because you have too much food? And so I volunteered at gardens and I volunteered at some farms and I, uh, visited all the gardens in the area, I read some books, I watched videos, and I just started to, you know, bring it all together. And I also was learning foraging, so I went out on some foraging walks, like the walk that will go on tonight for anybody that's going to join. And I uh, got some books and the same thing, just brought the knowledge together. And so over that first, uh, originally I gave myself just six months from going from 0% to 100%. And that six months turned into 10 months because I also started a lot of, or a few community projects during that time and was also doing a lot of other things too. Um, this wasn't, I was, you know, socializing and learning other things and going traveling and all sorts of you know, things like that. I had a girlfriend and her only interest was not turning yards into gardens. And so over that 10 months, what I did is I was just getting all of these gardens established and continuing to educate myself more and more. And then I was also doing a program called Community Fruit Trees. So we planted over 100 fruit trees in publicly accessible places where anybody would be able to enjoy the fruit like front yards along the sidewalk or churchyards or um, along bicycle paths. 
And then we started Free Seed Project and we sent out seeds in that first year to 2,000 people who wouldn't otherwise have access to seeds so they could start their own gardens. And we started a program called Gardens for the People and we built gardens for five families in their front yard so that they could, you know, break free from the grocery stores as well. And so I was doing that at the same time. And so day one of the project was November 11th, 2018. And the first meal that I had was actually the first 100% homegrown and foraged meal of my entire life. So I had been pretty busy leading up to it. And when I finally got started on day one, I was diving right in. And so over that next year, I grew over a hundred different foods in my garden. A lot of ones that you've heard of, like broccoli and kale and cilantro and rosemary and thyme and, you know, dill and oregano and basil and, uh, you know, all of the, many of the typical annuals. But I also focused on growing a lot of perennials, um, foods, you know, I was in Florida, so like katuk and moringa and chaya, not chia. It's very different from chia. And uh, perennial spinaches like Suriname spinach and Brazilian or Okinawa spinach and all sorts of foods that few people have heard of within the confines of, you know, mainstream U.S. American society. One of the foods that I grew a lot of that so many people I know have never had is yucca. Not, not yucca, that's a, that's a desert plant. Yucca, also called cassava, is a plant that over one billion people around the world would pretty much cease to exist without. It's one of the most important staple foods in the world. Um, cassava or yucca. And so I grew both a lot of your typical annuals and then a lot of your perennials as well. And so I grew 100 different foods and then I foraged 200 different foods from out and about, whether that was urban foraging from abandoned lots like mangoes and apples or being out in the woods and doing my fishing and harvesting, you know, the very interesting invasive wild yams, which is again something of Florida, not of up here. Uh, and then of course your, your many different weeds like plantago and dandelion and uh, well, other, other great greens like stinging nettle and wood nettle. So I foraged over 200 different foods. And so over that year, between the 100 different foods in my garden and 200 different foods, forage, that's over 300 different foods, which is almost a new one for every day of the year. So a pretty wide diversity. And it was definitely difficult, just the amount of time that it took, um, but also just the dedication that it took to turning down meals at other people's houses and passing by the restaurants and having to if I was traveling, bring the right amount of food or be able to forage it. So there was, you know, it, w it was very difficult, but at the same time, I managed to meet my needs. The area that I struggled the most was about halfway through, I became, I believe, deficient in fat. And I was eating tons of coconuts, which are very high in fat, but that just was not enough. That wasn't doing it. And interestingly enough, the food that I was, was the best at foraging going into it, the skill I had was fishing, just could not catch very many fish for some reason. I was really not doing well fishing. So I was struggling to get enough fat. And so about halfway through, I was, I was struggling there. I think my, I was low in like your omegas, your DHA, and, and fats. I could feel a bit of a brain fog and sort of low energy. And I ended up taking a trip to northern Wisconsin where I'm from, and I brought 100,000 calories with me, which when you have to live off the land, counting calories actually has a real benefit, because if you don't have enough, well, you, you might eventually just wear, you know, dwindle away and cease to exist. So I went north, 
um, to be there for the summer and then that's when I caught some lake trout and I could it was it was really interesting lake trout are about 15 percent fat and I I pressure cooked the lake trout and found that I could eat the entire thing like bones cartilage eyes brain skin meat and within one day I gained a pound and I think basically that lake trout just sort of became me over a period of a couple of days like I could feel my body just incorporating exactly what it what it needed and then I harvested some deer that had been hit by car by cars some people like to call them roadkill deer I like to call them deer that have been hit by cars and the reason why is they they were a deer before they were hit by a car and they're still a deer afterwards a lot of people have this sort of association of it being some like something other but it often it just looks like a deer that's sleeping on the side of the road it's nowhere near what people would imagine as far as like thinking it's really really gory or anything like that unless it's an interstate and it's a semi that's a different story but I'm harvesting them from roads where it's like 55 miles per hour so anyway I over that month regained that fat and that I needed and ended up finishing with 15% body fat. The only reason I know that is I ended up speaking at University of Wisconsin La Crosse and happened to be staying with the the sports scientist guy and so he put me in the dunk tank and uh, so I, I finished off the year one of the most beautiful things was without getting sick once and so when I say all of my food that includes all of my medicine so I put to test the idea of letting my food be my medicine and my medicine be my food and so my belief is that all of our food is medicine when we're eating foods that are not destroying us you know fast food isn't medicine in fact fast food is the system that requires us well that then results in us taking pharmaceuticals because our food is actually what's poisoning us but when every single thing we put in our body is coming from the land and is nourishing us our food is our medicine and then all of the medicinal herbs that I harvested the mushrooms like hen of the woods and uh, chaga and reishi and lion's mane and then all of my medicinal herbs and plants like um, elderberry for making my elderberry syrup from my my honey that I harvested from my bees along with the elderberries that I foraged um, I put that to the test and sure enough I made it one year without getting sick once so for me it was a beautiful testament of our food being our medicine and our medicine being our food and being able to break free from pharmaceuticals that being said definitely want to acknowledge I am a young already relatively healthy person but also want to acknowledge that 90% of our pharmaceuticals that we use are used for things that are preventable through good health and connection so you know some pharmaceuticals have a, a much more of a place but the vast majority are used pretty carelessly and uh, you know in place of actually taking care of ourselves and putting healthy food and, and medicines into our body and so I just want to talk uh, for a few more minutes and then open it up to questions and discussion because that's really you know I, I much prefer that versus me just talking the whole time but I want to share the two biggest lessons that I've learned through this and that I've incorporated into pretty much my whole life and my activism and my intentions of the way that I be the way that I am the way that I exist so first is that the solutions to most of our problems lie in community so yes I was growing and foraging all of my food and not accepting food from others you know even food that other people grew in their gardens not because I don't value that but because I wanted this experiment and I wanted to see I wanted to learn and this was the best way for me to learn but it wasn't about self-sufficiency this wouldn't have been possible without community every piece of knowledge that I had came because I learned it from somebody else and 
sure, I was growing and foraging all my food, but it took the whole community of resources that were put together, the seed growers, the small seed companies that produced the seed, the nurseries where I got the plants, the uh, people who have developed these crops over hundreds of years. And of course, long before that, all of this knowledge exists for the most part here in what we call the United States because of the indigenous knowledge, because of the people that have existed for thousands of years living in reciprocity with this land and that knowledge being sometimes gifted from them but often stolen from them. And everything that I did, all the foraging that I did, all the growing I did came because that knowledge existed long before me. So the solution to our problems is not self-sufficiency. When I first got started, I liked the idea of self-sufficiency when I was first breaking free from the American dream and consumerism and capitalism. But what I've really realized is that for us to break free, it's about coming together as community. And I think we will break free when we actually truly embrace that we need each other. Not this idea that if we earn all the money we need, we can have what we need and then we can be free, but instead to realize behind every dollar is people. And behind every dollar we spend is not independence, it's actually codependence. We are dependent upon one another. And that community goes long beyond just humanity. That community is our plant and animal relatives as well. Our existence only is possible through a deep relationship with this broader community. Our body is more bacterial cells than it is human cells. That is our community. We are a community of bacteria. Without bacteria in our intestines, we cannot digest this food. We cannot assimilate it into our body. And of course, without all of the animals doing all of the plants and the animals interacting, we simply would not exist. And then the second solution and the second element of how I try to, you know, live my life is through biodiversity and diversity. So when you look at our current global industrial food system, which many people would call broken, other people would say it's not broken, it's actually working really well for the small percentage of people that it's designed to work well for. But when you look at it, what you see is at the center of it is monocrops, corn and soy being two of them. That's the opposite of biodiversity, that's the opposite of diversity. That's the destruction of our millions of species, subspecies, varieties of foods. And that is at the center of the great destruction of earth and humanity. The opposite of that is Diverse, is biodiversity and diversity. So in the garden, this was an easy lesson to learn. A productive, abundant garden that is resistant to pests and drought is a garden that has dozens of species that are actually interacting with each other and where if one fails or two fails or five fails, you still have 30, 40, 50 other species that can be doing well. So there was a woman um, it, that was part of one of the gardens. It was her yard and she would always come out to me and she would say, oh, we've got aphids on the kale or, uh, you know, the lettuce is getting bit up by caterpillars. And she was always focused on the one or two. And I would say, well, how about the other 98 species that are doing incredible? What if we just think about those ones and we just forget about those? We got plenty of food. We have more food than we can eat. That is possible through biodiversity. And so the more that we build our gardens with that in mind, the more we're building resilience into our food system. And that includes things like food forestry and centropic agriculture. So the question was, during this month, have I felt satiated on most days? And then has there been worry about where my food is coming from? I have not felt satiated at at first, and part of the reason why is, so I gave myself just nine days to prepare. I'm not doing a survival experiment. This, that's not what it's about at all. Because first of all, I knew I was gonna do great. Like, I knew I, I, knew I was gonna get the food I needed. So it's not, it's not a survival experiment. Like, 
I didn't go into this with any worry that I wasn't going to be getting enough food. Between wild rice, venison, and applesauce, plus just a mess of greens every day, no prob. Like, I knew it wasn't going to be a problem. Um, but I knew what I worried about was whether I was going to, it was going to be tasty, whether it was going to be delicious. And also, just one note about the whole, like, having enough each day, people sometimes ask, like, they think I'm just harvesting each day what I'm going to eat. And I can tell a rookie when they ask that question. Because no forager in their right mind would do that. Because the key is when you find the abundance, you harvest it and you process it. Whether, and that's, whether that's canning it, like jams and jellies, that's like water bath canning, or pressure canning, like my fish and my venison, or wild rice, I harvested 31 pounds of wild rice one day and 45 pounds of wild rice another day. So I got 75 pounds of rice. That's quite a bit of rice. I only need a pound a day of rice to meet my caloric needs basically for a day. So I harvested 75 calorie days of just from my rice alone from those couple days of ricing. So I have no shortage of food whatsoever and I knew that I wouldn't uh, have a shortage. I was not satiated, I'm satiated today, and I was satiated yesterday, and I've been more and more satiated over the last week, but the two things I've been lacking was salt, and that's because I started in Wisconsin, and I, like, I only gave myself nine days and I didn't bring in any prior food, so that meant I had to wait till I got to the ocean to harvest my salt, and I got to Boston on day 19, so I went 18, 19 days without salt. That was challenging. <laughs> food is at least what savory food without salt. Wow. The first meal that I had that night, I tasted this food that I'd been eat that I'd been eating the same food this whole time, but all of a sudden there were all these flavors in the pot that weren't there before. And the salt is I, I just I do not know how I would do it without salt. Maybe over time you'd come adjusted to it, but salt has so much more satiated me, so that's one. And then of course, fermented foods like lacto-fermentation, things like sauerkraut. You can, you can ferment a lot of different herbs and greens. And then of course, um, you know, I didn't make apple cider vinegar or apple vinegar or fruit scrap vinegars. Having that makes such a big difference. And I just didn't have the time for that yet. So I know that I could be incredibly satiated over time. Because imagine, I gave myself nine days to prepare, today's day 22, yet I'm, I'm eating a basically full diet. To me, it's like, wow, that's, I, I am elated with that and excited and, and the hopeful about the possibilities. Um, and I'm, hope, and I'm so incredibly excited about how I can figure out how to make it so more satiating. And of course, the way to make it more satiating is, is to be harvesting the abundance at all the different seasons. You have your maple syrup in the spring, for example, and then you have like your, you, you know, your nice fat trout at a different time of the year. And then your, your, you, know, you have your... You, your smoked foods and you have your nuts that you're harvesting in the fall and you bring all that together to make a complete diet. Mine has been only what grows in this window, which is awesome because I've really gotten the flavor of late summer fall. But then the, the last thing I need to satiate myself right now is just oil, um, which either means getting a deer that's much more fatty because the last year I harvested was just lean as can be, or the hickory nut oil. And so it, it takes one five gallon bu bucket of bitter nut hickory, also called uh, yellow bud hickory, to make three quarts of oil. Three quarts of oil is a lot. So if I just harvested one gallon of this hickory, which is abundant in this region, um, yes, I'm, I'm ending the project in DC and I know it's abundant there because after this project is over, I'm gonna be doing that. I have about I have probably a couple hundred hickory nuts that I've been waiting to make the oil from. Hopefully I'll do that like tomorrow or the next day.
But anyway, if I can make this hickory nut oil, which I know I can, it's just a matter of time to do everything, I'll have a complete diet. Uh, so maybe tomorrow or the next day I'll make that. Yeah, other questions? Yes. And like what, what is your thinking? What do you hope people get out of following your journey? And what do you hope, like the actions that come Yeah, I really pre appreciate that question. So what's like the wider picture of what I'm doing? I would not be doing this project of foraging 100% of my food just for the, the ex fun of that, the experiment of that, or even for just showing people that food is growing freely and abundantly around us, which that in and of itself is quite something for people to realize the food's growing everywhere and we can then break, you know, use that to break free from the global industrial food system, which ties me into exactly what my big picture is, is that my goal, my purpose is to help people break free from oppressive systems, broken systems, inequitable, unjust systems this dominator culture where our way of existence doesn't serve the majority of us but instead serves a small percentage of ultimately the wealthy people that dominate so much of the world. So my, my intentions is to shine a light on these broken systems, these uh, oppressive systems, and to give people gateways to step outside of them in ways that uplift their spirits, that help to reconnect them with the earth, and in doing so, empower them. Because I believe people will become empowered when they, have, when they can see the power in their hands. And when people grow their own food, they feel that power. I don't know anybody who, do, who doesn't start to grow their own food and start to really feel some serious power behind that. And so finding as many ways that people can start to feel that power and that empowerment to see that, yeah, I don't need all of these consumeristic products that I thought I did. I don't need all of these all of these fancy clothes to cover up who I really am. I don't need to pretend to be what I'm really not. I don't need to buy into these societal structures and these societal norms that eat away at my soul. And instead, I can do what really serves me. And my hopes is that people see that what serves them is serving others. I think that one of the greatest lessons that I've got through my last 10 years of, of you know, life and activism is that the happiest people are people who are living in service of something greater than themselves. And all of this around us is greater than ourselves. If we can learn to be stewards of the earth and stewards of humanity, we can like start to shed our egos and you know, focus less on ourselves as individuals and start focusing on our humanity we start to realize that we are only as important as anybody else that's around us and then we're going to work on you know living in a society where we're less focused on taking but more focused on living in reciprocity with one another so so again to summarize it's about breaking free from these oppressive systems but doing it in an empowering way where people can start to feel more joy more meaning more purpose more passion and organically start to feel that so that breaking free isn't a negative thing and it's not a, a, a pressure and a like giving up of, of what makes life great, but instead it's shedding all this extraneous and unnecessary and instead finding that, that meaning and purpose. And of course, to add to that, I think this is already clear by me having said that, but ultimately the goal in no way, shape, or form is it for everybody to do as I do. It's for everybody to do as brings them their deepest meaning and purpose in life. Me, for me, that is being an activist. For me, I love being an educator. I'm also a performer. Like, 
from birth, I've been, uh, I've been someone who likes attention. I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, it's often because you didn't get enough, uh, you know, attention as a child, but I don't recall that being the case, like not having enough. It could be that. But for me, like I've always liked to entertain people. I've always liked to shock people. I've always, I've loved to like make people say like, wow, you can do that. And, but that's not my goal is to get others to do that. It's to ask themselves, what's my purpose? If, maybe it's being a caretaker. It could be an educator. It could be uh, an organizer. It could be a politician, a, an, uh, um, a lawyer. Uh, it could be uh, a gardener, a, a forager, wild crafter. It could be just, it could be an activist. It could just be a human being who sits on their porch with friends and talks and hangs out and plays cards and that's enough. And so that's my goal is not by any means for everybody to do as I do. Because additionally to add to that is that I definitely want to acknowledge like I am a very privileged person. I didn't know that growing up because I grew up with less than most people around me. Like we were very low income. It was my mom and us four kids and she only made about 15 to $18,000 a year. We were Jewish in a mostly Catholic Christian place. So, you know, I, I felt, you know, ostracized in that way. My mom was a hippie. We were weirdos. Like Greenfields were not cool at all. <laughs> Greenfields, my last name. Um, and so I never felt privileged growing up. And it wasn't until I was like in my mid 20s that enough people made, you know, commented on social media and like enough people said it enough times where I started to like realize, okay, yes, I wasn't the most privileged person where I'm from, but if you look at gl like the global norms and standards, I'm, you know, I'm, from the United States, I'm, I'm white, I am, you know, identify as the gender that I am, I have all the physical capabilities, I fit into the box of what's considered normal, um, I am a man, I have a U.S. passport, uh, I have a college education, I'm able to, you know, speak like very clearly and explain myself in situations of like potentially dealing with a police officer. I'm sure I missed out on some of them, but ultimately, like, I come from, that is, that's who I am, so that's where I'm operating from. But uh, I acknowledge that what I do is not possible uh, for a lot of people to do. So it would be extremely ignorant for me to say, like, I want people to do as I'm doing. I definitely don't. What I really want, and this has turned into a very long answer, ultimately, but what I really want is for my main, like one of the main groups of people I'm talking to are the privileged group of people who have time, energy, and resources who can say, actually, I have enough. I don't need more. And I can share my resources with other people that have less. That's like a big central part of my goal is to help people to live from an attitude of gratitude, of gratefulness, rather than the attitude of needing to climb to the top so that people who are ultimately in the top few percentage of the world that are comparing themselves to the billionaires but they're millionaires and saying I don't have very much can actually say actually I have so much and I'm going to start to actually share this that's my way of trying to create equity so that's a few thoughts on that thanks for asking here oh wait actually you asked one so let, I'll come back to you <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, yeah, using social media, kind of, is it effective? Is my activism through social media effective? Um, and is it, is it working with people, making changes and learning? And I, yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Since back in Florida, 
since then, I'm now on the board of directors of a community farm. I run several gardens, free to pick for anybody who wants to go in throughout the valley. And, you know, inspiration's inspiration. Keep doing it. Good, good. Yeah, I can say that uh, I'm not able to use social media nearly as effectively as I would like to. Uh, I have not been in the algorithm lately with the whole Facebook and Instagram. They have not been on my team. Um, they have been at other times, and I hope that they will get back onto my team sometime uh, in the near future. What does that mean? It means algorithms mean that it's not a matter of whether people want to see the content you're sharing. It's a matter of whether they choose to put it into people's news feeds. And they have not been doing that. So uh, I'm, that's been a challenge that I uh, need to overcome. But um, I will say that the reason that I'm continuing to use social media as a tool is because enough people do share with me that me being a part of their life via social media is meaningful enough. That often it's that they live in communities where they don't have support and they feel the support by just having someone else who shares that. And me being able to take it to a kind of a whole nother level of extremeness with some of this stuff makes them feel a little more sane. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I, I can be the, I'm the crazy guy so that other people don't look as crazy because people are like, well, that Rob Greenfield guy is a lot crazier than you are. So it makes other people start to look a little more normal. Um, but I can say that, yeah, a lot of people, you know, I'm, a, I'm actually, you know, I'm a marketer. Like, basically what I do is I create stories that are designed as packages for media to be able to tell, for millions of people to be able to see. So I did run a marketing company before I did this. When I woke up in 2011, that's exactly what I was doing, was running a marketing company. And I was knowledgeable in search engine optimization and social media management and things like that. You know, I learned it. I wasn't knowledgeable to start. But I've always been a messenger. I've always been a storyteller. And so what I've learned to do is tell stories in a way that media can then report on issues in a w that gives them like a way to, sh to share these messages that's uh, more interesting that more people are likely to read and see. And so that's what I do on social media as well. And so the reality is it's a difficult balance because I'm not actually being exactly who I want to be. Like my number one personal goal in life is just to truly be myself. Like that's the most important thing when I die is that I've achieved just simply being myself. And I've definitely come a long way, but I still have a ways to go. And the most challenging aspect of that is designing things in a way where it's going to work on social media and like playing that like I'm not willing to I'm not willing to go nearly like so many people are willing to just bend themselves in a way that's not truly themselves I'm definitely not but I will present like more excitement for something and and not that, like that not be exactly who I am and so social media is definitely like a challenging thing for me and eventually I'll be done. Like I'm 36 and my goal is to not, you, not be on social media like when I'm 40. I'll still be on there. I just won't be running a page though. Like people can film and I'll, you know, be there, but I won't be like diddling away on it. So yeah, social media has been a great tool. It's also my greatest weakness in the sense that it feeds the ego. Um, it uh, is highly addictive. It keeps me up uh, at night when I could be getting quality sleep. I think in rather than the present moment, but in the how can I tell this story, which you can do without social media. Writers do that. Photographers do that. Directors do that as well. So it's not just social media. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm overcoming those things for sure. But uh, those are all challenges of working with the social media, definitely. Well, it's how you access your, if you want to teach, who are you going to teach you have to, if you're not in a classroom? Yeah, know. social media is a great way. That being said, a lot of people would say the only, like, but you couldn't do it without social media. No. And I, actually, I'm kind of old school, so I definitely could. Uh, eventually, my plan is just to 
to go places and then just let the news or the news stations know I'm there. Like, for example, I just did an interview with People Magazine down in the garden. I didn't have to be on, the, in, on social media. They came. They'll put that out it, online on, like, Tuesday. Uh, so that's my long-term uh, game plan, and that's what I've been doing, is building lots of media contacts so that when I'm going to do something, I just let them know, and then I say, I'll be at this place at this time. Come if you want to. And that's kind of like the long-term game plan of being able to break free from social media because ultimately, you know, Facebook is one of the more destructive companies on earth in, in certain ways. And I don't really, they aren't in alignment with my beliefs, but I'm definitely using them. And so that, of course, is another element of how it's not really super in alignment. The best, the best what? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Other questions? Also, just want to say, no question is too weird. How do you travel when you're moving around the country and you, you you're on this? Yes. How do I travel? Uh, Private travel? jet only. <laughs> Packing must be a fear for you. <laughs> yeah. So how do I travel? It depends on the trip. So, um, you know, sometimes it's biking by bicycle is wonderful. I've done three bike trips across the United States. Of course, I did fly back afterwards. Um, that was, so yeah, I, I, I often travel by bus or train and I've traveled a lot by hitchhiking. I also travel a lot by just Craigslist ride shares. You know, like if I'm going from Florida to Wisconsin, I'll just put an ad up. And sometimes I just post on social media that I'm going that direction and people will see that. And sometimes I have been, had a really hard time finding a, like a ride share, but someone said, I'll drive you there. So sometimes I, I do that as well. I actually, uh, and then sometimes I fly. I fly only when uh, I believe that the positive impact that I can have through that flight is outweighed, outweighs the negative impact. So when I go to Europe, for example, I've gone to Europe to do TEDx talks twice, but I didn't just do one TEDx. Instead, I did a, like a month-long speaking tour all by train and bus around Europe. So I flew just to get across the ocean and then gave like 30, 40 talks and believed that that was worth the flight. But... Just a few months ago, I got rid of my passport. So I no longer have a passport, and I no, I no longer have any form of identification. I got rid of my birth certificate uh, a couple months ago. Before that, I had gotten rid of my driver's license and my social security card. So as far as traveling goes now, I have no ability to fly, which is a, both a relief and a little like, hmm, interesting. But I chose to do it. And um, next time I travel internationally will be by sailboat and I will need to find someone who's okay with a stowaway and I'll jump off at some harbor and uh, enter you know, the country without a passport. And, uh, but right now this travel is with a teammate of mine and he is driving his car. I ride in the passenger seat and he's uh, my teammate who does the filmmaking. So he's the one who's producing the films for you know, telling these stories. And you pack your food accordingly? I mean, you're, that's got to be a big concern, too, as you're traveling. Yeah, so... Eating what you want to eat? Yeah, with this project, yeah. It's got a, it, a car with a trunk is key to be able to carry all my food. Because it's a lot of food. And I'm carrying a dehydrator, a pressure canner, you know, pots and pans, and lots of jars to store food, a cooler and uh, a few other miscellaneous things like a blender and so uh, bags of walnuts and you know all sorts of different things so yes it is uh, it's great to have a car for this for this project and i wouldn't do this project of foraging 100 percent of my food while giving talks and plant walks in different cities without a car it could feasibly be done on a bicycle Definitely could be, but it would just be a big, much bigger challenge. I would need to be eating a lot more wild rice, too. Can you say more about the decision to get rid of all your gamification? 
What was the question? Can you say a bit more about your decision? Oh, sure. Sure. The question is, uh, yeah, why get rid of all of my forms of identification? So sometimes people look at my life and, and not saying this in your scenario, but often on the internet, people look at my life and they, they see the one thing that I did and then they make all of their judgments and observations on that one thing. And they say, well, that's just absurd. But everything that I do is based around an entire life plan and a life design. So me choosing to get rid of, of all of my identification is part of the bigger picture of me choosing to remove myself in as many ways as I can from this government and all of the oppressive systems that they've, cr that they've created. So I've chosen not to pay federal taxes for the rest of my life. It's been six years since I filed taxes and I will never, and since I've paid federal taxes and I will never pay federal taxes again. I do that legally by making less than the federal poverty threshold, which I've committed to life to making less than the federal poverty threshold. In the past, I think they call this like tax resistance or something. I don't remember the exact term. Um, but it was often used as a you know, resistance to war, like during the Vietnam era, for example. And so the idea is, what are our taxes funding? Well, over 25% of our taxes go to war. So I've chosen not to pay for our wars. Our taxes go to uh, the, the military industrial complex. They go to the, poli the, the, to, um, to the police industrial complex. They go to um, our prison industrial complex. That's the word I was looking for. So what that means is that my taxes are paying for police brutality. Standing Rock, when they brought out the military equipment, that was paid for by taxpayer dollars. I was at Standing Rock, and I wasn't going to be at Standing Rock paying the taxes for the military to be there at the same time as I was there, for example. So getting rid of my IDs is a part of the big picture of me choosing to step away from these oppressive systems. For one, because I don't want to be a part of them, and for two, to show people that we can step away from them. And so. The IDs on their own, not having IDs is, you know, not so much, but it's part of the bigger picture of stepping away. Um, you know, not having a driver's license, that's a big thing. It means I can't drive a car. I still get in cars, but it means that most of the time I ride my bicycle. I'm not perfect, but most of the time I ride my bicycle, and if I'm feeling lazy, I can't just get into a car and drive. I still have to ride my bicycle. And I can't, I don't have a credit card, and I don't have a bank account, which means I can't just, on the spur of my moment, be like, hey, I want to travel to another country right now. I can't. It, it, I would actually have to jump through some hoops to do it. So all of these things also make me jump through hoops to do the things that I may not really want to do, that it may be more of a spur of the moment thing. If I want to buy something online that I don't really need, I have to find a friend and say, hey, could you buy this and I'll give you cash and you pay with your card? And that means I'm going to do it way, I'm just going to have way less transactions. So it's, it's a way of like helping me to do exactly what I want to do as well. Um, and for example, I'm never going to pay rent in the sense of like needing to have, I have no credit. I have no credit score. So I can't get into debt. It keeps me out of that possible trouble. So there's so many elements like that, you know, it's tied into helping me to live the, the life that I want. Right now I can't fly internationally and a big part of that is that I want to be more like place-based. I want to more, be more deeply connected to this land rather than be able to go anywhere at any time. I rent a house, I, I, ha I currently have a nonprofit, and I rent a house for the team of people who work with my nonprofit, and they work for food and lodging. And sometimes I sleep in the laundry room there. Before it was the mud room, but then I brought in another team member. Then it was the laundry room, but I brought in another team member. So now I don't even have the laundry room, but there is a little nook under the stairs that I can sleep in. And then um, I, there's someone who's got an unused cabin that I've been staying at about 20 miles south of Asheville. 
so that's that's basically my base right now so I haven't had a really permanent home since I guess my tiny house in Florida that I lived in during my two years there that I and then I and I gave that away when I left kind of like dumpster diving there's loads of houses and shelters and places out that are being unused yes I stay with a lot of people right now I'm staying with Ross <laughs> here in New Haven <laughs> so because I travel a lot I stay with a lot of people thank you Ross well, one, he's got a wonderful little nook. We call it the Harry Potter room, right? It's just this tiny little nook that's full of my food right now. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, two more questions, if people would like, in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned communities that you've seen that were sort of inspirational for you, or who were really trying to like, go on the journey of food independence. So I was wondering if you could talk about what some of those communities were, and what they were doing that was Sure, yeah, mentioning some communities. So if you're interested in um, intentional communities, I recommend the website ic.org, which stands for Intentional Communities. And this is a network uh, where you can learn about all sorts of intentional communities exist. And some of them take in visitors just to like learn about them for a day. Many of them have openings if you're interested in learning, uh, living in an intentional community. Earth Haven in Asheville has a week where you can stay there and it's like kind of getting the experience of living in an intentional community. Earth Haven is an intentional community in Asheville that I've been to a couple of times. I haven't been to nearly as many intentional communities as I'd like to. Um, as far as some food communities, there's uh, one that's a, a really incredible community is called uh, Soul Fire Farm, which was started by Leah Penniman up in, up up in New, in New York? Wait, yeah, yeah, New York, yeah. Um, and so my communities that I end up in are definitely just miscellaneous, different, whether they're small communities, like there was one I stayed at in Florida called the Peanut Butter Palace, which was like a college eco-community. Um, and so I've stayed in lots of different ones, like in my travels. And, uh, you know, there's also, of course, Woofing, which is Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. And that's a really great way to get connected to community. That's less of like the permanent community and that's more of a bit more of a, like a temporary type thing. Um, so, a few thoughts on that. Any, any other way you'd like me to go into that? Mm. Yeah, my community aspect is much more like, it's just we're in community at this moment, you know, and everywhere that I go I find community uh, just of people who care and people who have similar goals of, of breaking free, whether it's the excitement of growing food and foraging or, uh, you know, not trashing the earth or just wanting to live happy, healthy, free lives. My community, for, my community is really just connecting with, with many different people and, of course, plants and animals every day as well. One last question. Here. Have you? You've got a beautiful, wholesome approach to life, to existing. Have you been, like, uh, like what's going on now with the pandemic, the pros and the cons, facts versus unfacts, have you gotten flat from being... You say you call yourself a weirdo. Have you gotten flack from Kellogg's and Purina or whoever these people are? Like, you know, um, he's not legit. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a fake news. Yes. So the question is, yeah, has I, have I gotten flack? You know, uh, or you know, as some would say, like haters. There's plenty of people who think I'm just incredibly absurd. So the good news about uh, the good news is that I'm reaching enough people where there's a lot of people who really disagree with me. And so, yeah, if you look at just the comments on my social media, there's plenty of people who don't agree with me. If you look at the comments when I'm, you know, in like, for example, the Daily Mail or uh, the Guardian or things like that, there's a lot more people who don't agree with me and there's a lot of people who just say a lot of really 
unnecessary mean things. But what I've learned is that those people are your greatest supporters. The reason why is they get you in the algorithm. And they do my job for me of getting me out there. And so I wouldn't be reaching nearly as many people in a positive way without them. So, and the other thing is that if you're going to reach a lot of people, the more people you positively reach, it guarantees you're going to be having people that are going to be unhappy with you, that are going to be uh, angry with you. And fortunately, I have the ability to handle that. I don't mind it, especially because one of my personal jobs is to turn negative things into something positive, hence seeing them as my, actually my greatest supporters. I have plenty of, you know, I will say, I think I've done a good job of not being judgmental and not telling people what's right or wrong, and in doing so, I don't get nearly as much of the negative media and negative press and the sort of stronger, as people would say, haters. The main people, the people who have really come out against me the most have been people who didn't get what they wanted out of me. It was people who liked me a lot, they loved me, and I didn't give them enough ten attention. And so then, because they didn't want to be rejected, I was evil. I was the bad guy, so then they didn't have to handle like not getting the love that they wanted. That's like, so I have a, there's a few people on the internet that just go out of their way to say a whole bunch of like, you know, ultimately lies. And all of them are people that just didn't get the, the, the love or the attention they wanted. As far as corporations, I've had no corporations that have, you know, come after me, which means I'm either really crafty or I haven't done my job well enough yet. And time will tell on that one. And um, no government has come after me yet. So I designed my work to be, you know, again, accessible, non-judgmental, and to also be like, you know, when I'm working on food waste and talking about hunger, most people can be like, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense to waste all our food, waste half of our food while, you know, 50 million U.S. Americans are food insecure. So I also really do choose to stay away from things that are too polarized because my place in society is to be with the people that wouldn't otherwise listen to, to some of the other long-haired hippies that they want to use the back door. I still want them, even though I'm barefoot, to let me through the front door of their homes so that I can bring my foraged meals into their houses and introduce them to the plants that are growing around us. So it's this balance that I definitely walk. So on that note, it is 4.30, which is great timing because that leaves a half hour before the plant walk for anybody that would like to regroup a little bit before. So we're heading over to, uh, to East, what's Rock the park? Park. East Rock Park. But before that, I just want to say I love you all very much. I'm so grateful for you all being here. I'm so grateful for all of you taking time to be working to improve your own quality of life and those around you. And um, I'm excited to share a hug with everybody that would like to share a hug. I love that, you know, we're a small group, so we have time for that. And uh, I'm excited that we have more time together at the park for the plants. I'm also excited to get a little warmed up and make some tea <laughs> before that. <laughs> <laughs>